Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for joining us today. And uh, uh, on this Thursday afternoon, uh, or it could be morning where, wherever you are in the country, but uh, thank you for joining us. We have a, a lot of information today. And the title of this course, is, uh, as was mentioned, is Excellence in Denture Technology. And when the, we're gonna do some comparisons uh, from uh, analog to, uh, and to digital going through this course here. So we have a lot of information to go through uh, in one hour here, and we'll take some questions as was mentioned at the end here, but uh, uh, we're excited to get started here. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Dennis Urban CGT. I was a little younger in that picture over there, but uh, probably have over 42, 43 years in the dental technology business. And I've had the opportunity to travel the world, lecturing and learning and, and work, going to laboratories and working with clinicians. And I only talk about what's been successful for me, you know, in, in my, my career. And, um, you know, I love lecturing, I love writing. Um, I write for a number of different journals and I'm also the director of clinical education for National Dentex and also the 2021 National Board of Certification Chair person. So that's very rewarding also, just trying to get uh, technicians certified and uh, getting them more involved in our industry. So excited to get started. So we're gonna get started right away here and we're gonna talk about technology. You know, we've come a long way with technology, especially with removables. You know, uh, as you can see on the top picture here, this is a picture of George Washington's denture made of lead and whalebone and everything in between. And uh, then we have a picture of this vulcanite denture on the bottom, which was a hardened rubberized denture. This is back in the 40s and 50s. And I still saw this, some of these dentures when I was when I started my lab in, uh, in 1980. We used to get one of some some of these lab, uh, these dentures once in a while. But, uh, you know, we're going to looking back at that technology. You know, we're going to look at how far we've come and, and we move forward in, in uh, denture technology. So uh, we'll go through some of the techniques and, and some of the technologies that we've uh, excelled in over the last couple of years. And some of the, the advancements have been in denture based acrylics, denture teeth, digital dentures, partial denture materials, and you know some of the stuff I don't have the time to talk about today, uh, hybrid dentures, over denture cases. Um, and we've come such a long way with advancements in denture technology. And it seemed like for a long time, uh, to, it was just on the crown of Ridge side that we saw these advancements. So we were like the stepchildren. We never saw those advancements it's, it's in denture technology, but now we have them. And whenever you go to a dental show or you, you, uh, you go online to try to find the course, it's dominated by dentures and removables now. It's amazing, which I love. It's great because it's one of the topics I love the best. So, uh, so now we have highly aesthetic teeth with unsurpassed denture-based materials. We'll talk about those denture-based materials in a little while. And uh, also, you know, these are some photos of the dentures that I've done with uh, characterization. And, you know, we want these dentures to look natural. We don't want them to look like dentures. With the technology we have today, you know, the patient doesn't look like that. They have to look like they're wearing a denture. So now we can match the existing gingiva on the patient. You know, many times I'll get a photo of the patient's natural gingiva. I'll even match it on the, on the wax-up. And then when the case is being processed or after it's processed, I'll actually match that uh, gingiva also. But uh, I mimic natural gingiva anatomy on wax try-ins, utilizing artistry and various shaded waxes. Um, you know, we have diagnostic wax wax ups for crown and bridge. Why can't we have a nice characterized wax up on the, on the denture so the uh, patient can see what that denture is going to look like when it's finished? So uh, and now we have metal-free clear partial technology also. And we're going to elaborate on that a little bit later on. You know, metal-free metal free partials are aesthetic. Uh, and if you use the right materials and do it with the, with the right uh, method, you can get a beautiful partial that's going to be functional for years. And now we can print and mill accurate aesthetic dentures with amazing fit, form, and function. And today we're going to focus on the milling part of it when we get down into the presentation a little bit more. But uh, I'm going to start with some basics also. You know, so we'll get, we'll, but we'll get into the milling aspect of it. We don't have time to get into the printed denture today, but uh, we're going to talk about key mill and printing and how to process a denture and uh, using the correct materials. So, but more people need dentures now than ever before. And the industry predicts tremendous growth now through 2050. And experienced denture technicians are the guides for dentists and patient success in a denture prosthesis. And that's a quote by Dr. Stephen Wagner, who's a prosthodontist. And I was at a Seattle study group meeting a couple of years ago when I was watching Dr. Christian Koshman, who's a very powerful lecturer and clinician. And he said, professionals who understand dentures are the one who, ones who understand smile design. So we as denture, denture, denture technicians, you know, we have to fill an intraocclusal space of 40 millimeters or more, and we have to know what we're doing. You know, there's anatomical landmarks. Sometimes we don't have enough information to go by. So, you know, like Dr. Christian Koshman says, we have to understand smile design. 
And we do understand smile design once we understand occlusion, aesthetics, and setting teeth. So I always like to stress that. And even, even you know, when we're doing digital dentures, it's the same way. So we want to move in the right direction with digital and analog. So we want to apply those sciences that we learned on the traditional or analog side and bring them over to the digital side also for a successful case. Let's talk a little bit about the digital transformation, you know, preparedness, production, and profitability in the digital world. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to create a more personal and predictable surface. And uh, we want to build the intelligent design platform. You have a lot of choices out there, you know, with Exacad, 3Shape, and all these different millings, milling machines and, and printers and different materials. So there's a lot of choice, good choices out there to, to cre uh, create that personal and predictable service. Doctors want to engage their patients. You want to empower your technicians, want to optimize your opera operations, and transform your digital offerings and expand them. So digital technology is amazing. You know, we, we utilize it so much on the crown and bridge side and implant side, and I'm seeing it evolve at a fast rate on the digital venture side. But it all stems on communication also. We need to have those communication tools to plan effective cases. So again, comparing digital and analog, we still need to utilize the same fundamental prosthodontic processes to make a digital denture as we always have. And the clinician still needs to communicate and provide the technician with the necessary information for a functional case. And digital technology is still evolving, like I just mentioned, and improving at a rapid pace. If you asked me three or four years ago about printed technology, I would just say, I don't want any part of it. And now I'm looking at printed technology now, it's amazing, you know, so what's going on, you know, for, for printed dentures and even with mill technology. And basic knowledge of prosthodontic, prosthodontic principles, including providing accurate impressions, is even more important in the digital world because many details can now be seen on a large screen, which we couldn't see before. And I'll show you a photo of that later on. The things that you can see on, on, a, on a screen now with digital impressions and digital scanning is amazing. So, uh, and dentists still need to understand the importance of, of capturing accurate maxillomandibular uh, records, vertical dimension, and centrifugation. And technicians need to continue to analyze ridge relationships and then select the appropriate anterior and posterior teeth for the desired occlusal scheme. Even though some of the software picks those teeth out for you, sometimes they just not, you might want to pick something else. You really have to know the science of, of choosing teeth, especially on the analog side. So the growing dentalism, yeah, it's growing like crazy. You know, we have more than 36, and I think it's up to 40 million Americans have no teeth, and 90 of those have dentures. 90% of those, 90% of those have dentures. It's amazing. So uh, but most of those patients are unhappy with their dentures. And a lot of clinicians are not in a comfort zone with making dentures because they feel it's a lot of share time, you know? So, uh, and significant share time reduces the your, your return on your, rest, on your investment. So there's a lot of dissatisfied, frustrated patients out there. And, but we you know, even with on the traditional analog side, if you utilize the same principles and the correct planning and the right materials, you shouldn't have any problems with the, in, on the, in the chair. You know, so it's just, you know, following a protocol with even on analog dentures is very important for a successful outcome. So what are some of the problems with full dentures? We have compromised stability, especially on a lower denture, poor neuromuscular coordination, that, that includes occlusion. We have to decide what type of occlusal scheme we're gonna be incorporating on the denture and a low tolerance of mucosal tissues for a removable acrylic base, which means a lot of sore spots, especially on lowers. And the patient's desire for more stability and comfort. That patient doesn't just want to put that denture in so it fills out the, the intro occlusal space. They want to be able to chew and function and smile and get their self-esteem raised so they can, they can function correctly and look good. So, and I mentioned earlier, the comfort level of the dentist is compromised during the, due to the excessive chair time. You know, I went around this this past week. I was going around to different uh, the different residencies and giving lectures about preparing the residents for communicating with the laboratory. And a lot of that talk was about uh, doing removals and dentures and following that protocol so they can get into that comfort zone for doing these types of cases. So the goals of the final outcome is to create natural aesthetics. We want to enhance facial appearance. We want to compensate for that lost soft tissue and enhance the function with the right occlusal scheme. It could be an implant case where you're utilizing a lingualized occlusion or centric occlusion or physiological centric occlusion. You know, we wanna create a denture with longevity, impact resistance and bacteria resistance. And this is where those materials, quality materials come into play. And we wanna eliminate or reduce adjustments on occlusion and of course, eliminate sore spots.
And some of the common mistakes in fabricating full dentures, poor treatment planning. That's lack of communication, poor treatment planning, distorted impressions. I think we number one phone call we're still making in the laboratory is on distorted impressions. Number two is bite registrations, inaccurate master models, insufficient occlusal records, and the poor choice of materials. All of these things, all these factors can create the demise of a case. And you know, want you want a successful case. Nobody likes remakes, you know. And um, so what I try to do when I'm planning a denture with the clinician I'm working for, we go through an exam checklist. And the, they, the clinician does this in the office also. Look at physiological factors, anatomical factors, functional factors, and aesthetic factors. And some of the questions they ask during the preclinical interview, interview is, what are your specific concerns or limitations? How long have you been a dentalist? How many dentures have you had since your tooth loss? How did you lose your teeth? And when was the last time your dentures were relined? I mean, I know patients and hear stories of patients just having a denture not coming back for five, seven, eight years, you know, uh, and finally getting a reline. What happens in the interim? They have a lot of atrophy to the bone and to the, the tissue, and uh, th those, those um, dentures should have been relined and looked at on a regular basis. And if it's a situation where the patient is really uncomfortable and there's enough bone density, we can give them an overdenture and, and, uh, or, an, or a hypertype denture. So we ask them, have you ever considered implants? If you look at the patient complaints, the history of potentialism, the support in those dentures, the stability, the retention. And we also have to look at the floor of the mouth and the tongue room for, and, and position. You know, I, I go around to laboratories also training. And I look at the uh, when dentures are finished or even designed on, on uh, 3D software. And I see so many times that the, um, they don't take into consideration the, the, uh, the, the size of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. So that, that tongue can rest comfortably into that lower denture without tripping it or creating sore spots on the tongue. And it's really, really important to look at that aspect of it also. And you have to look at the border extensions, central relation, VDO, phonetics, aesthetics, occlusion, and of course, opposing dentition. So all these, these things come into play when we're planning a, a successful denture. But let's start getting into the uh, nitty gritty here and uh, look at the best practices for full dentures. These are traditional best practices for full dentures. And the clinical protocol has been at least five visits. You know, and we're able to cut that down to actually three visits now on the digital side. And I'll explain that to you later. And I, I know some laboratories are actually cutting it down to two visits on, on a denture now. And, um, and I try to get across to a lot of clinicians that, you know, sometimes it's not the amount of visits, it's, it's the quality planning of the case and the materials. So, um, but the first visit is usually the preliminary impression. Second visit is that custom tray final impression, then your bite registration, then your tooth setup with the wax try-in, and then the fifth visit is the uh, final insertion. Now you can eliminate um, one visit if you take a functional impression inside a base plate with a bite rim. So that's, in other words, you're talking about taking a functional impression and a bite registration at one time. And this is what we do a lot on the digital side. That's gonna eliminate one, uh, one visit, so, uh, which is great. And you know, many times what the doctors are doing in, in, the lab, in the operatory, even with digital dentures, they're taking a wash impression, scanning that impression, taking a wash impression inside the exist, existing denture, scanning it, scanning the bite, and sending us the STL file, and that's really going to be three, a three-visit denture. So also, like I just mentioned, taking that wash impression in, in, uh, in the existing denture, that's going to help us uh, on the analog side and on the digital side with cutting out some time. So, so I'm going to go through some basics here. I always talk a little bit about basics here when I'm talking about uh, these types of cases and dentures. You know, it's really important. I don't care how advanced the course I do, I talk about the basics. So, you know, first visit, we really want to capture all the anatomical landmarks with either a stock tray or something that's going to a tray that's going to be close to what the patient's uh, ridge is, is uh, form is. You want to cl get close to that ridge form. Use a quality alternate material. And if you capture all those anatomical landmarks, you get a good preliminary impression. Chances are you're going to have a good final impression. And that second visit is going to be your custom tray impression. You know, and um, you know we the doctor has to make sure they're capturing all those anatomical landmarks and also doing border molding. You know, it's really important. So when I'm making this custom tray on these types of cases, I'll go to two to three millimeters short of the border. You know, so, and uh, I'll ask the doctor to put adhesive on the borders, put a monophase or a heavy body material on the border, put it in the mouth, have the patient, have the patient move around the cheeks and talk a little bit and capture all that, that musculature in the mouth, take it out of the mouth and then come over with a medium or light body material after putting adhesive in the tray we'll get a nice functional impression, nice, beautiful impression. And uh, this is what we need. And even on the uh, digital side, we need to do this also. 
So here's a picture of border molding, putting that uh, uh, heavy body material on the border of the tray and then uh, doing border molding and then taking the impression. So this is that functional impression I was talking about before. So you have almost like a, it's a light cured custom tray with a bite rim on top of it. And uh, so the doctor's capturing the by registration and a, a final impression in one visit. And as you can see here on the right hand side, I came about two to three million millimeters short of the periphery so the doctor could border mold. And this is the impression that we see here, master models of the functional tray and functional impression. And, um, and there's a final impression. Doctor really used a lot of material for border molding, but this, this particular doctor liked really full borders on, on the dentures that he, that he provides his patients. And you know, the bite registration using this functional impression with therapeutically designed bite rims, it's one of the most reliable ways to transfer the oral situation to the articulator. That's a beautiful impression here. We captured everything. It wasn't as thick as far as the border molding compared to the previous one, but we still have a nice impression. We have the hammerial notches on the upper. We have uh, the borders, retromolar pads, the lingual uh, side of the lower here, and myohyloid. We have everything we need for a good functional uh, impression and a good successful case. This is an inaccurate impression. We have pressure areas with pro probable over, over uh, extensions on the tray. As you can see, the tray showing through the impression material, loss of detail from excess saliva. And not only that, if you look at this impression, this is a real heavy body material. This is a polyether material. And if you have a really heavy body material when you're taking a, a, a full, full uh, edentulous impression, sometimes you can compress the tissue and that'll, that'll result in sore spots. So if I saw something like this come in the lab, it's gonna raise some flags for me. It's overextended. I don't like the impression material. It didn't capture all the uh, landmarks or loss of detail. And so I would either take this out or make a new custom tray from this impression and ask for a new impression. And how about this impression? I, I laugh at this, I, you know, it, it wasn't funny for the patient. This is an actual impression I got in the laboratory and this poor patient must have been uh, choking. Look how far down the throat this impression material went. And if you look at the overall impression, just take a look at the impression, see what you see wrong here. You know, after all this impression material has gone down the patient's throat, there's nothing on the anterior region. The tray is overextended. It wasn't border molded. So I was good. I would ask for a new impression for, for this particular case. So, but uh, look how much impression material went down the patient's throat, the poor patient. Uh, but uh, I like to show that. So you're probably asking yourselves, what about intraoral scanning for, for, for large cases? Well, scanning is possible, but, but it's still not perfect. We have, there are a couple of clinicians out there who have perfected it. They're doing a great job with it. But most of the cases I get with fully edentulous scans, are we, they need some help. You know, let's put it that way. Additional steps must be taken and case selection is critical. You can use an indelible pencil to help with stitching issues when scanning a particular arch, when there are very few landmarks or reference. Uh, but, uh, you know, cases with tissue texture and landmarks are going to be easier to scan. So we must make sure to capture all the anatomical landmarks. I, matter of fact, I just got a um, scan the other day for a partial denture and I was missing the palatal, palatal area, you know, and uh, I called up the doctor. I said, doctor, I said, I need the palatal area. We have to, you know, we have to put a bead line. We have to bring that part, that horseshoe uh, upper partial down to a certain extent. He said, oh, do you really need a pal palate on this impression? I said, doctor, we need a palate. So we had to send that back and get a new impression. But, um, you know, to some studies I mentioned before, for instance, Dr. LaRusso, he did a dentalist scan strategy and uh, for, uh, for uh, scanning dentalist ridges. He was very successful with it. And he was using three-shaped trios. And if you look at these directional, uh, the direction he went with these scans, this is what made these, uh, these scans successful. You know, he started uh, on the ridge on the right-hand side on the upper and went to the left-hand side. Then he went in the palatal area and then went around the periphery. So he had a directional um, type of uh, sit, uh, system that he used for successful uh, edential scans. So he's, he's been very successful with these. Meanwhile, uh, there was another study done with the Journal of Prosthetic Research. Uh, Prosthetic Research, this is February in 2020. And it was an in vivo feasibility study with uh, optical impression taking of 29 patients. And the conclusion was, within the limitations of the present study, the scanners were not able to currently fully replace a conventional impression. So they had, they had some problems. But look at the directional uh, capacity of the, what they did with these, uh, these essential scans. It was quite different from Dr. LaRusso. So that could have been the reason also. But I still see problems with patients who have real, really bad undercuts or really bony ridges and we can't get, uh, get back to the retromolar pad or even to the, uh, the hamial notch area. But 
it's it's getting there. It's getting there. It's getting close. We still we're starting to get more and more successful um, intraclosal scans with uh, fully edentulous patients. So at this point now, you know, but the best practices in full dentures, we're on a third visit. You know, we're ma making the you know made the by registration on onto our final model, and now we want the correct information from the clinician so we can do a setup in the laboratory, a successful setup. So uh, we want to make sure we get all the information we need on this particular uh, by registration. So let's look at the functions and requirements for um, a by uh, occlusal rent. I'm just going to go through this quickly, just to show and review what we actually need. So what does a base plate function? What does it do? It aids in the transfer of accurate jaw relationships to the articulator. And base plates simulate a finished denture base. So that's why we try to get that base plate to fit as well as possible so that, that patient can feel what, how, pretty much how that final denture is going to feel. And the same thing with printed triangles, we do the same thing. And we'll talk about that in a, little, in a few minutes. And it's utilized for occlusal rim and for the denture setup as a guideline for the denture setup. And the re rim requirements, you know, it's the placement of the occlusal rim that should be placed in the anticipated position of the denture tooth setup. So this is why we try to contour those occlusal rims uh, just to where we think it's going it's to be perfect. You know, so we follow the anatomical guidelines, maybe going eight millimeters out from the papilla, utilizing an alma gauge uh, and uh, utilizing tools like that to do that. And the wax rim must be secured. And we want to contour that wax, wax rim in, these, in, in the right fashion. But we also need that information, as I mentioned early on in the presentation from the doctor on, you know, occlusal plane, canine line, midline, cuspid line, spine line. Because whether we're doing this analog or we're scanning this into a software, we need, to, we need that information. You know, we want it to feel like we have, we have the patient at the bench with us when we're doing these cases. How about this by registration? This was a natural case that came into the lab. I got it in my hands and I said, wow, what are we doing here? What is this material, you know? And it's like beeswax, aluwax, and everything combined. And the impression wasn't that good either. And this, this was going to be an, an immediate denture. So, um, you know, I called up the doctor. I said, doctor, first of all, we, let's, let's make a custom tray and then we can take a new bite. And I heard the five or six words I hate hearing the most and that was, Dennis, do the best you can. So uh, on a case like that, you couldn't do the best you can because what's going to happen? It's going to be a remake. So I, I kind of, I refuse to do that because it's going to be a lot of money and time for both of us, you know? So why not getting a new impression, a new bike registration in case was successful. So, but you know, when the clinician takes the bike, you know, we want to make sure that the occlusal rim is that the, uh, from, on the posterior region, it's occlude, the occlusal plane is put parallel to the campus plane. And that campus plane is from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear. And as you can see on the left-hand side here, that occlusal plane is dipping down posterior, uh, with, uh, uh, as you can see, with, at, at denture holding that, the dentist is holding that occlusal plane. We want it to be e equal with the campus plane. So in this particular case, the doctor had to cut back the wax a little bit. So after that, as you can see on the top right here, it's nice and even with the campus plane. So the occlusal plane is equal with the campus plane. We're not going to have to worry about a reverse smile when we set up our, our denture teeth and we're ready, ready to go. So, so we get the occlusal information from the, uh, uh, from the clinician and we're ready to set our denture teeth. Um, I don't have time to go into in-depth on denture tooth setups today, so we're just going to touch on a few things. But on this tooth setup and wax try and visit, the dentist should check occlusion, phonetics, and shade, and make sure the aesthetics are pleasing to the patient. So if you look at the traditional denture workflow in a laboratory, you know, you have the you have four steps for a model, from preliminary impression, make a custom tray, make a occlusal rim, set your teeth and wax, and process and finish. And with the digital denture workflow, it's pretty much follows the same guidelines if you're doing, uh, you know, a, a preliminary impression. But on that uh, third, third uh, visit, we're scanning it in final impression or model, and we're, we're designing and, and doing a printed triangle. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then every, everything looks good if we mill or print the final denture. So let's talk a little bit about analog denture setups. So when it comes to different types of articulators, you know, if we're doing full mouth reconstruction, we want something that's gonna mimic true jaw function and we you know something with an interconjugal distance, maybe about 110 millimeters, which is about an average what we have in between uh, each side of the jaw. Semi-adjustable or fully adjustable. A straight hinge articulator might be good for a partial or maybe a single unit crown or something like that. But I like to use a good semi-adjustable or fully adjustable articulator. So what I'll do, I'll mount it on a semi-adjustable articulator and, and the occlusal plane is aligned and marked to the occlusal plane of the articulator. 
As you can see, in many times, it's at that little slot on the incisal pin, it slots on the posterior region of the articulator, and I'll put a rubber band on there, and uh, I'll put the center of the model uh, that is identical to the occlusal plane of the articulator, as you can see here. So I'll mount that, uh, that lower model, and then I'm ready to mount my upper model here, nice and neat, at the occlusal plane perfectly, right here, and I'm ready to set our denture teeth. So I don't have to worry about these not being in the right position and throwing me off when I'm trying to set denture teeth, which is great. So here you see the lower teeth are set. And I set up here. I usually set my upper anteriors first, then my lower anteriors, then upper posteriors and lower posteriors, and I go from there. I'll use a template when I'm setting my denture teeth. That's ready to go now. This is a, this is a full upper, full lower setup, setup on the um, articulator semi-adjustable articular later. And just for your information, I do have courses that I talk about uh, denture setups anywhere from the beginning to advanced. So when we explain, and I'll explain the step-by-step -step procedure for this. So, and then if you look on the, on the, uh, uh, on the digital side, we have digital articulations with, uh, you know, virtual articulations with fully, in, uh, fully adjustable articulators, which is great. And you can see, Central and lateral adjustments, it gives you all the movements of a uh, you know, fully adjustable articulator. It works out really well, you know. So, uh, so I love designing a case with, you know, on 3Shape or Exacad and, and doing a full denture because I can get all the aspects of a fully adjustable or semi-adjustable articulator in front of me on the screen virtually, which is pretty cool. So and we have to look at the Frankfurt plane, the horizontal plane, the campus plane, like I mentioned, and then the occlusal plane. We're setting up these dentures, and hopefully we got the correct information on the occlusal rim when we're doing these full cases. As you see, your camper's line, occlusal plane, and then we're ready to set our, our dentures here. So, uh, so all this information is so important to us when we're setting up our denture teeth. Um, many times we don't get this, you know, and I was teaching that this week to the residents. I said, please, when you're sending a case, please give us that information on the occlusal room. We need that, you know, and so it's really important to, to have a successful case. Otherwise, it's going to end up in a reset and it's going to cost patient time. It's going to cost uh, laboratory and the clinician time. So, again, setting anteriors on an average on the anterior, on the anterior, it's about 20 to 22 millimeters from the periphery on the upper, 18 to 20 on a lower. And then, uh, you know, usually it's the second molar is like half the height of the retromolar band. So, we want to set up our anterior teeth and position them individually and parallel to the pupil line. And those lower incisal edges are parallel to the upper incisal edges here, as you can see. So you have nice, nice anterior set up here, and then we're ready to set up our posterior teeth. And now we have to pick out this, this type of posterior teeth. And typically, the smaller the ridge, the less cuspal inclination or less degree of the tooth. And the greater the ridge, the greater the degree of the tooth also. So if we want to select the correct mold uh, on these posterior teeth on, on implant cases. I use lingualized occlusion, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And when we're setting our lower teeth, we want to align those occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium. And what is this called? That's your curve of Wilson. And from anterior to posterior is a curve of speed. The only time I don't have my uh, curve of Wilson is when I'm setting teeth in lingualized occlusion. And lingualized occlusion is when that lingual cusp of the upper goes right into the central fossa of the lower, creating any, uh, eliminating any off-axis stress on the implant or the ridge. So I won't have it, my, my curve of Wilson and I'll have a nice flat occlusal plane. So when I set those teeth up on the upper and that lingual cusp is gonna go into the lower, I know it's gonna function correctly with uh, lingualized occlusion. And the actual inclination of the posterior is the center of the cranium. And then the upper follows the guidelines of the lowers. Again, I don't have time to go into in depth here, but just you get the idea. And a lot of you have done setups already, you know, so. And then for that fifth visit is that final insertion. Want to check for fit, form, and function, check for pressure spots, pressure spots. Hopefully the occlusion is good and you don't have to equilibrate the, uh, the occlusion. You know, so uh, it's really, you know, a lot of uh, following the protocol that I just spoke about in order to get that, uh, that success. So let's talk about denture bases now. So we're at that point, we're ready to process the case. Everything looks great. What are we looking at a denture for in the denture base? Yeah, you know, well, the natural look, we want accuracy. We want something with a variety of gingival shades, something that's going to be impact resistance, but also have flexural strength. Because if you don't have impact, flexural strength and impact resistance, you're going to have brittleness, and that denture is going to break. And we want good finishing and, and, and polishing properties too. Then something that's going to be color and have fits uh, stability. You know, it's really important, and especially 
you know, I, I'd like just to mention too, you know, when we're doing hybrid cases or even overtension cases, there's a lot of stress on those, that acrylic, a lot of stress on that teeth. And denture teeth tend to wear faster on those types of cases and there's more stress on the acrylic. So I always, I always tell technicians, even doctors to just ask for an acrylic that's gonna have high, high impact resistance with flexural strength. You know, uh, I know there's a lot of acrylics out there on the market, but if you're gonna utilize an acrylic, especially with those types of cases, utilize something like I just mentioned. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Diamond D. And I helped develop, develop Diamond D, oh, it has to be maybe 10, 12 years ago. And to me, it's one of the versatile, and one of the most versatile and high quality uh, acrylics on the market. I'm not saying this because I helped with it, you know, get this on the market, but we utilize this in the laboratory. It's, it's great, it's a great material. These are some of the dentures I've, I've done. Uh, you can see all the different shades they, they come in, uh, but the um, flexural strength and impact resistance just blow away everything else, you know, pretty much everything else on the market. I love it. It's consistent and it works really well. And and one of the, you know, you can use this with a regular heat processing, processing method, heat cure processing method, you know, anywhere to two to eight hours. Or what I love about it, I utilize it with microwave technology. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Microwave curing technology to me is, to, is one of the best ways of curing a denture. Of course, you have your, your injection, you have your, you know, your pore acrylics, you have a lot of different choices out there. But <clears throat> what I love best with the uh, microwave curing, uh, especially with the Technoflast that Keystone has, is that it provides a denture cured in four minutes. It's great. And I'll, talk, I'll go through this in a second here. So, but it's a great material. It's utilized, you know, and, and this same material is also utilized for when we talk about our uh, implant denture for the, for the puck we're gonna talk, the key, uh, the key mill puck and in the, on the digital side. But let's talk a little bit about the microwave technology first. So there's something called the Technoflask that um, Keystone came out with a number of years ago. And this has to be one of the, the most durable, strongest flasks I've ever used. I mean, I'm still using the same flask that I've used, I used five years ago. I mean, and we use it every single day. And, uh, but utilizing microwave technology with this material is amazing. And not only with full cases, I utilize with, with uh, partial dentures, hybrid, hybrid type dentures, uh, mill titanium bars, uh, it works fantastic. And you, a lot of people say to themselves, well, how can you put metal in a microwave? You can do it. If it's shielded and insulated by dental stone uh, and gypsum, you can do it. You know, so, and it's even, even on the outside, you can see here on, on this flask here, there's metal parts, you know, and doesn't have any effect uh, in a microwave. So. So one of the ways to cure this successfully in the microwave is to use the Diamond D heat cured polymer with something called the 20 minute cure monomer. You know, and 20 minute cure monomer was utilized for 20 minute cure with heat cure and put in into a, uh, a boiling water bath, you know, for 20 minutes. So, uh, so we took this technology, I did some experimenting on processing and, and uh, it worked great. You know, and I also utilized heat cure monomer too with uh, the heat cure polymer. That took a little bit more longer. That took about eight to 10 minutes to cure in a slower method. Because what happens sometimes when you're curing acrylic in a microwave oven and you're not doing it correctly, uh, it creates gases in the monomer, which creates porosity. And you don't want porosity in your dentures. You don't want to have to re repair these dentures. But what I like about this material, it's consistent time after time. So. When you're mixing the acrylic, just follow it. Follow the instructions because I've gone in laboratories and watched them mix acrylic, and they have a big cup and they start pouring monomer and start pouring powder and polymer and start mixing. This is going to screw up the whole expansion rate on your denture, and you wonder why the dentures don't fit correctly and you have a lot of excess free monomer. That's the reason. So you really want to follow those manufacturer's instructions on these types of cases. So first thing I'm doing, I have my waxed up denture here. And we're ready to uh, invest this case. And I'm going to put a little Vaseline inside the uh, Techno Flask. And the first half is, is uh, invested in a, I put, I utilize a half and half mixture of plaster and stone. And then I put a little Vaseline on there. I'll tip the, put the top half on, screw down the bolts. And I'll put my second half of the gypsum on there. If I screw down the bolts, I'll pour it in there and vibrate it in there. Let it set. And after it sets, what I'll do is I'll take the bolts out and I'll put it in the microwave for about a minute and 30 seconds. And what am I doing? So instead of putting this into a boil out unit for you know a couple minutes, five minutes or whatever, uh, it, this is softening up the wax and making, so a lot of times it comes out in one piece. I'm softening up the wax and getting it ready for boil out. And this works out great. And it takes a lot of, if I put this in boiling water, it takes a lot of time for that heat to penetrate that flask, but the microwave, microwaves penetrated immediately. So this is here after I opened up the flask, 
I cleaned it up, I boiled it out, put my diatork holes in the teeth, and I used Diamond D separator, UltraSep, and the case has come out spotless. So I, I like to uh, keep everything in the system. So that's what I I'll utilize, Diamond D separator, put two coats of separator on there, and then I trial pack. I do two or three trial packs, get the excess out of there, make sure I have enough compression, close up the flask, and then I put it in the microwave for four minutes. And after four minutes, I let it, I let it, it gets really hot. Let me tell you, those microwaves penetrate that flask. It gets really hot. So you have to be careful don't, but when you pull this out of the, uh, the uh, microwave oven and let it cool for about 20 minutes and then put it in cold water. And make sure you're using a microwave at about five to 700 watts because you don't want to use something that's too high or an industrial microwave because it could burn the flask and also do damage to the denture. So this is the case here. You can look how clean it is on the left-hand side and look how nice it looks after it's polished. So really nice material, works really well. And, uh, you know, I, I love it, it's consistent. I get the same results half the time. This is looking at it in the mouth here. It's hard to see the acrylic there, though. You can see it's a beautiful, beautiful acrylic. So let's talk about the mill denture workflow now. Let's see how much time we have here. We're good? Oh yeah, we're good, okay. So first appointment, if you're doing a preliminary impression, this is gonna be a four appointment denture. Uh, and uh, what I like to utilize sometimes uh, is um, it, it, special tools, papillometer. That'll give me an idea of where to build up that bite rib. Give that papillometer gives me readings from the papilla to where the incisal edge is going to be on the teeth. And then I'll fabricate our base plate in the fluzzle rim. And what I'll do when I talk about, talk about Fabricating our base plate in the fusel room. I'm, I'm making that uh, functional base plate so the doctor can take an impression and bite at the same time. So the doctor's on the second appointment is going to take that functional impression and bite registration, send it to us. We're going to scan, design, and print the try in, send it back. If everything looks good, we're ready to finish it on the fourth appointment, as you can see here. So we're going to mill the final denture on the fourth, for the fourth appointment and, and insertion. So that's a four appointment mill denture workflow, as you can see there. So let's talk about key mill. Key mill is the exact same material that you just saw with the Diamond D. It comes in various shades. And you, you, we, what we do, we just utilize a milling machine, you know, so um, for, for milling these dentures. And uh, it's us, utilizing the digital workflow. And we're gonna talk about that in, in a second here. And the results are great. So what's the first thing I do? I, I digitize the case. I, I put in all of my information. I'm utilizing 3Shape. That's one of my favorite softwares uh, to design dentures with this sheet 3Shape. I put the name of the patient, the order number, and then I'll start designing the denture. And, and then I'll scan. I'll scan either the model or I'll scan the final impression. I find better results in scanning the model. Or if the doctor had a successful scan in, 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 the, in the operatory, we already have the STL file with the bite registration and the, and the, uh, and the model. And so we, that saves us some time right there. So we're going to scan that, uh, that final impression on that model. Look at, look at the details I talked about earlier. Look at the details on the screen. Now you can see the nice details on the ridge. It's amazing. You know? So we're going to design our, uh, our denture now. So before we do that, we have to scan the bite registration. So this is an upper and lower bite registration uh, occlusal rim that I did. And what I did here, I, I'm putting it on the, on the E3 3 shape scanner. And I, I sprayed some scan spray on here just to capture all the readings that the doctor gave me with the midline, cuspid line, and high lip line. So all of this is going to be scanned and merged with the with the model. So and you talk about digital articulations. The impressions are digitally articulated to the bite registration using specific software. And denture teeth are placed following the arc shape of the of the, uh, of the bite registration. So the vertical height can be adjusted in the software. We can open and close the bite if necessary. We can do full arc setups in, in one you know in a matter of seconds actually, and you can adjust those. And the software proposal is reasonable. It can be modified using the software tools, which is great. And using the software tools and every aspect of the digital wax up can be adjusted. So what I try to do on the uh, printed try-ins, I'll try to make the printed try-in with all the contours of a finished entry, just so the patient can see what those contours are going to uh, look like. And uh, and then instead of having that monolithic type of try-in, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead of uh, myself here, but I try to make it look like a nice, um, nice, Good anatomical wax up too with this uh, with these these triangles too. So I'll talk, I'll elaborate on that in a minute. So and certain modules of the three shape software allow for complete complete control of the change the shape of the tooth. Let's see if we could see that on this picture here. Hopefully, so we can bring that tooth down into occlusion, make it longer, and 
this is what we do when we're making the change in the shape of the tooth. Um, you know, we have a choice sometimes when we're making these milled dentures. We can either use carded teeth or we can use milled uh, milled teeth or milled PMMA. So when you're adjusting the width of the teeth here, you want to make sure you, this. Most of the time, you're only able to utilize the um, uh, PMMA or milled type of, uh, of tooth. So you're not going to be able to take a carded tooth and get that uh, get, the, get those adjustments on the carded tooth. So we'll talk about that in a second. So we don't have to do a complete reset when the tooth needs to be removed, which is great. Removing molars and premolars is as easy as a click of a mouse, as you can see here. Now you see it? And now you don't. See, it was pretty quick, right? So we eliminated that bicuspid there. And uh, so the software tools are, are really neat. I have fun with this when I'm designing these dentures. And, and what I like too, when you're doing an immediate denture, you don't have to worry about doing model surgery. We call it model surgery, right? When we're doing an immediate denture, we're cutting that model down and then contouring and, and doing some uh, you know sculpturing and tissue sculpturing and everything like that. All we have to do is look on the left-hand side here, highlight that denture tooth, and it disappears. So we can do an immediate denture in, in seconds and get that model prepared. And if you go to the right-hand side, you'll be able to see the contouring that's necessary that you can do also. Look at that. Beautiful. And now we're ready to set our denture teeth to do an immediate denture. So, and the design for immediate dentures is simplified by using the pre-prep scan and overlay functions, allowing us, the user, to set the denture teeth using the existing teeth as a guideline. So how many times do we do that? Make setting denture teeth for immediate, we use those, those existing teeth as guidelines, and now we can do this online too. So uh, with, uh, as, as, as far as using the um, uh, 3D software. Here we go. Nice, nice pre-preparation scan. <clears throat> and I love this too. I utilize this also when I'm using, I'm using, I'm doing um, uh, my implant cases, and especially for hybrid cases, it works out really well. So, and as you complete the denture design, at this point we're ready to print the try-in. And you look at the traditional workflow. You know that that you know that fourth visit is using that denture wax try-in. Now, if we got that wash impression and the bite registration on the first visit. The third visit is going to be that printed try-in. So, and this is what the printed try-in looks like. You know, <clears throat> they come in various shades now, and um, but I like to characterize it a little bit. So, um, you know, it's a monolithic try-in, but you know, you can still adjust these. You know, and make your adjustments. You know, it can be marked with a sharpie. Say if the midline is off, you want to move that midline. You take a sharpie, you can mark it, and if the posteriors are a little high or the occlusion is off, you can grind down the posteriors and take a new bite. And even if the dentures don't fit correctly, you can take a wash impression. And this is sent back to us at the laboratory. I'll scan it again and merge it with the original file. And we can either do another printed try-in or we can go to a finish. There we go. Okay, so how can we make a printed try-in look more natural? Well, there's a couple of ways you could do this. You could spend a lot of time and money by using denture-based stain, which you can, and some doctors do pay for this for, uh, with us when we do these printed try-ins. Uh, but I like to just contour it correctly in the software when I'm printing it. And all I do is take aesthetically this colored wax. I heat this molten wax up. I go over the contour of the printed try-in, and it works out beautiful. I could do a wax, a characterized wax up in a matter of minutes with these aesthetic colored wax. And you're not going to look like it's not going to look like it does on top. You know, it looks, you know, look like something you see on the, on the bottom here. So you want to color, give it a nice characterized look. Um, some of the things like the feedback when I first started sending these uh, <clears throat> printed triangles to the doctors, they were trying to move teeth with a hot spatula. You know, so if you're used to doing that, it takes a little getting used to. You know, as far as um, doing these print, these printed triangles. We want to talk now about milling the puck and bonding teeth to the base. Take a quick drink. Of so there's there's some confusion with this here as far as um, you know bonding teeth to the base and um, after it's milled. There's a few things you can utilize. You know as far as you know doing this type of um, uh, this this type of procedure. You know you can mill a PMA full arch. You can use carded teeth. You can go to a denture tooth library. For instance. Three shape comes with Candelar and uh, library. Uh, I use Vita. There's certain tooth libraries that are accessible on the market that you can utilize. And in this particular case here, as you see on the lower screen, I'll talk about this in a minute. I use Vita teeth for this, you know, so it worked out really well. But you know, we want to make sure those are bonded correctly to the uh, to the uh, denture base and these these uh, denture teeth. So 
let me just go to the next slide here. Here we go. Good. So we want to bond these teeth into the built entry base. So, you know, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of time. We can utilize bonding agents. There's a few of them out on the market. Let me see if I can pull them up here on the screen here. Yeah, there's a few of them out on the market. You know what I use on my case? I used a heat cured Diamond D acrylic with cold cure monomer, self cure monomer. I mixed it together and it's the same consistency that you see here on the right hand side on some of the other companies like Ivoclar and Densply have. Uh, and it works out great. You know, so I, and a lot of people say to themselves, I feel like I'm repairing a brand new denture. Well, using a heat cured polymer, so you're not really repairing it. So, uh, and the, the uh, mill creates that space exactly for those carded denture teeth or for that actually that milled, uh, those milled teeth or those milled PMMA that you utilized. So quite often I use the milled PMMA. And I'll use the milled PMMA a lot when I'm doing hybrid cases or if I'm doing an immediate case where we could do an all four conversion, uh, this works out great because I know it's going to be temporary and the patient's going to wear this for you know maybe six months till we do the final bar. Uh, this works out great. As you can see here, we mill the teeth. We have the milk puck. They fit perfectly into the slots here. And I'll utilize the, uh, sometimes I'll put diatoric holes in there. I'll roughen up the teeth a little bit just to make sure I want that bond. Um, and uh, it works out great. So either I'm using denture teeth or I'm using PMA or some of the other companies have a mill puck that uh, at a denture teeth that I can use also. So, so these are your final key mill dentures here. As you can, these are, this is one of the first ones I did. You can see how nice they came out. This is with beta teeth, and this was using the um, uh, Diamond D heat cure with self cure um, uh, monomer, and it worked out beautifully. You know, we still use these as samples. You can see them at dental shows, and uh, uh, but I was really happy that with the outcome of this case here. It really worked out nicely. So, let's see how much time we have. Oh, we have a little time. I think I have a little more time. I want to get into a little bit of clear parcels, then we'll take some questions. But this is just features and benefits between the digital dentures and mill uh, dentures and, you know, and uh, digital dentures. And one of the biggest features I feel is if, if something goes wrong with a digital denture, dog eats the denture, the patient loses the denture, oh, we have the file already. All we have to do is mill it, you know, and, and it, it's really not that big of a deal, you know. So, uh, and the fits that we've been getting on these mill dentures, uh, and even with printed, has been phenomenal. So it's raising the level of uh, comfort uh, level of the clinicians now. Uh, we're getting you know, really consistent results every time. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about ClearMed. I think I have about uh, you know, seven or eight minutes here, and I'm going to take some questions. ClearMed is one of my favorite materials. It's like one of the hot, hottest materials now in the laboratory. It's been, in, it's been it's in demand a lot, and it's a clear partial material, and it replaces metal, and it's done. It's still done by injection. Which, we still can't utilize the um, uh, full digital aspect of it to, to make this dent partial yet. But, um, you know, traditional metal partials, a lot of people can pay, you know, it's labor intensive. Patients complain of the uh, heavy metal taste to it, not aesthetic. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's that hot and cold sensation too you get with this metal partial. So this is a great alternative. And the metal framework timeline, and this is like for one frame, it could be anywhere from six to seven hours for every single step, you know, so. But uh, survey and design, duplicate models and refractory process, wax up the frame, invest, burn out and cast, sandblast and strip. You know, there's so many different steps and fit, finish and polish. So it's a lot of time. Clear mat takes about three hours and 28 minutes to do everything. You know, so we're surveying and designing, we're duplicating the model, waxing up the frame, investing it, heating it, and injecting it. So I'm going to go and then we fit, finish and polish. So I'm going to go through some of the... Uh, aspects of how we do this so we still need partial denture planning not every case not every patient can get this type of partial so we need to do our radiographic surgery surveys examination of all the oral structures you know sometimes a patient can't get this type of partial especially if it's a bad rupture on the anterior and if that patient keeps on breaking their anterior teeth off uh you have to be, really be careful of the proper um, planning on these cases first thing i do is wax up the frame i invest it and i'm waxing this up on a duplicated blocked out model so then I invest the case in stone, uh, a type three stone. I don't want anything stronger than type three, otherwise you never use the type, phone, type four stone or, or um, die stone, it's gonna be impossible to get out of the flask. I boil out the case, I put some diamond D separator, and I, use a, I utilize the Meyerson flex press for this, and this works out great. So I program the temperatures in the flex press, I heat up that flex press, and I have a tube with clear material in there. I put a little X in the tube, 
I put that tube in the uh, toaster oven for about 15 to 20 minutes. And the reason why I do this, I get all the moisture out of that tube. It, and it just tends to absorb moisture, this flare material. So if I have moisture in this material, I got to inject, it's going to stop the injection. So I don't want that. So, so I place the tube in the flex press. The alarm goes off. I press the, it automatically injects. Here's your injected case. I defest the case. I finish and polish the frame. I put my diator, my uh, uh, retention holes in the frame. And there's your finished case on the anterior, with the uh, anterior and one posterior tooth there. It looks beautiful. It just disappears in the mouth. All you see is the natural look of the denture teeth. So it's invisible, stain resistant. It can be relined, class for tooth, class for tooth bearing, and the class can be adjustable with a warm three prong plier and they stay in place once you adjust them. So love this material. Uh, I elaborate more on this in, in my other seminars. We can go really step by step in depth of how to do this, but it's a great metal free alternative for parcels. And also, you know, for existing metal parts to replace transitional cases, they're great for, you know, it's a lightweight and aesthetic and it has a natural to look to them. And so if you want to really digitize this a little bit, you can design the actual wax up uh, on 3Shape or Exacad and you can mill or print the wax, wax pattern. And that helps a lot. That helps alleviate a lot of the time. And then you can screw and invest. And you can see here, you can have this a digital clear met technique here. But it's not fully digital yet. I think they're working on that. Hopefully, we can get something fully digital soon, either milling or printing. All righty. Lastly, I'm just going to touch on uh, It's So Clear Clasp. Now, I don't even use wrought wire clasp anymore, and I like to talk about It's So Clear Clasp. It's the same material that we utilize for the, uh, you know, what we just showed earlier. Uh, and, and it's a it's a great, great you know, clear metal material. It's the same material. So. And what I'll do is this particular case is going to be an implant case. So I'm gonna make a transitional partial. I adapt the, clay, the class. There's, um, there's your uh, molar class, and then you have your uh, class that you can use on bicusp uh, bicuspids and anterior teeth, universal class. I heat, the, I heat this up with a flame, low flame, because if you heat it up too much, it's gonna bubble. I adapt it to the undercut of the tooth. I have to make a retention loop because it's not, not, no, there's no natural retention with this uh, material to acrylic. I, I wax up the case with clasp in place, and you can see on the left and right hand side, there's your clasp in place here. And this after processing with Diamond D, and this is the finished case with Diamond D acrylic and the so clear clasp. This is a transitional partial. We're going to do an implant case. This is a great aesthetic transitional partial for the patient. And look how beautiful that looks. Yeah. So this case I want to show. This was a case I, I got a little daring on. I said, you know, let me try making some rest seats. We had just done four units of, you know, four crowns, uh, some PFM crowns here. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adapt some rest seats onto this and maybe put some It's So Clear clasps on here. So what I did, I did rest seats, clasps. As you can see here, really nice case. It's really turned out great. I waxed it up. I process, invested it and processed it in the traditional method. You can see here the clasps are held together in place by uh, stone. There's some dietary holes in the teeth. And this is the case after it was done. Look how beautiful that looks. So, and the, cl the clasps just disappear. The natural shade of the tooth comes through the clasp and you can, you can thin them out a little bit. You can contour them, you can make them pointier into proximally. A lot of different, different things you can do, but look how nice they came out. Beautiful case. Look at those rest seats. That was, I took a chance with this. Doctor and patient loved it. Great. And there's your crown and bridge on there. It worked out beautiful with this case here. That's just, I dipped it in water to give it a little special effect here, but look how nice it is. Great, that beautiful. Can we make a better denture? I believe we can between the clinical Clinician, the dental technician, and proper case planning, and advancement in denture technology, it's a win-win. I'll tell you, I'm excited about where denture technology is going, and I've been in this, in this business for over 40 years, and I'm real excited, Simon. And uh, artistry through denture technology, apply your, your artistry, your know-how, your planning, and the, the material science, and you got a great case. Thanks, everybody, for joining me today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some questions now if we have time, so feel free to ask away, all right? Hi, Dennis. Thank you so much. So I have a couple of questions here. The first sure. one is, what's better, you feel, printing or milling a denture? Okay, that's a good question. You know, I ask this when I do my specific lectures on milling and printing. Um, I get a lot of, I used to get milling, milling was the uh, majority, you know, so like 80% of the doctors would say, I feel more comfortable milling. But now, you know, we've come so far with printed, I, I feel it's it's just about equal now. I mean, I love I love the printed denture now. If you're using the right materials, you know, so some great materials out there. You know, even even the uh, yeah the, the, the newest 
print, newer printed materials uh, that came out on the market in the last couple of years are, are great. You know, but milling takes longer. And I think, you know, milling um, as far as um, uh, the, the material, like the Diamond D material is great. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of other materials out on the market, but that's milling is the actual acrylic material. And you're using uh, with printing is it's, it's sort of a light cured material. So, but they've come so far with both of them. So I, 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 I'm, I, I like both. I, my honest opinion, I love where printing has gone, but I also love the results that we're getting with the mill denture, you know, especially with the diamond deep pucks, the fit, the fits are so good sometimes. The doctor's not even asking us to put a post name in the, in the upper denture anymore. You know, it's amazing, you know, good stuff. But thank you for that question. Okay, here's another one. What materials are used best for processing? For processing a denture, what materials, as far as, yeah. uh, I said, they mean acrylics? Talking about acrylics or? Yes, acrylics. Okay, yeah, so acrylics, I, you know, I'm partial to Diamond D because of the, the uh, high resist, you know, high impact resistance, uh, but there's a lot, you know, there's, there's quite a few materials on the market. I, I'm gonna say Diamond D is one of the best and you wanna make sure you utilize the right methods. I mean, you can you can you can even use, utilize Diamond D with injection. As far as the methods go, injection is very very accurate. You know, and you know a lot of people get caught up in oh my God, everything's digital. Everything is not digital yet. You know, it's still evolving. So the majority of cases being processed in this country and around the world is still analog in traditional way. So you want to make sure you do it correctly. So either you know injection or microwave or your traditional press pack. You know, it works out great. You know, so I'm still getting great results. You want to make sure you just follow, you know, the instructions of mixing the material. Uh, but look for an acrylic, you know, as far as the best, you know, look for an acrylic that's going to have good properties. You know, do your homework. You know, you don't want an acrylic that's going to be brittle. And and also look for an acrylic that's going to give you a great bond to denture teeth. You know, this, you know, a lot of acrylics out there don't they don't bond well to denture teeth, especially with the new uh, the new generation of denture teeth. You know, with the with the IPNs and the uh, um, reinforced uh, denture teeth with uh, ceramic fillers and things like that. It takes longer for the bond against the denture, the denture base. So you want something that's gonna bond well and Diamond D does that. So good question. Another, another question is why do you think Diamond D is the best? I, I like it because I, I, I've had um, uh, consistent results over the years. And I'm telling you, it's like, <clears throat> it has to be 10 years maybe doing, you know, and. With my particular lab, I was doing maybe 15, 20 cases a day, and I, I was utilizing. And at first, I was using like the heat, utilizing the heat cure, but I think the consistent results what gives me the comfort, puts me in my comfort zone. The last thing you want to do is start repairing dentures after you process them. And I didn't get that with a lot of the other materials on the market. And you know, it's, it's just uh, I. And there are other good materials on the market. I just feel comfortable with that. I love I love the shades. I love the bond between the denture base and the, and, and the denture teeth, and I love the fit against the model. You know, so uh, uh, if I got if I got complaints about it uh, over the years and didn't, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I would stop using it. But uh, I also get a lot of calls on on uh, as far as how to utilize Diamond D, what to use, and uh, and these are people have been using uh, started using uh, uh, acrylic uh, Diamond D acrylic years ago and are still using utilizing it now. And they ask me questions about um, you know uh, microwave technology and things like that. So I try to guide them. You know, so. I'm in my comfort zone, and a lot of people are with Diamond D acrylic. You know, I'm not. I'm not trying to sell a commercial here. I, I'm just telling what, work, what works for me, and it, it's been working very positively over the years.